Good day to everyone joining us and welcome to today's X Talks webinar. Today's talk is entitled Optimization of Tau Pet Imaging for Alzheimer's Clinical Development. My name is Sonia Hunt and it's my pleasure to be your X Talks moderator for today. Today's webinar will run for approximately 60 minutes. This presentation includes a Q&A session with our speakers. This webinar is designed to be interactive and webinars work best when you're involved. So please feel free to submit questions and comments for our speakers throughout the presentation using the questions chat box and we'll try to attend to your questions during the Q&A session. This chat box is located in the control panel and that's found on the right hand side of your screen. If you require assistance, please contact me at any time by sending me a message using that chat panel. At this time, all participants are in listen-only mode. Please note that this event will be recorded and made available to you for future streaming on xtalks.com. At this point, I'd like to thank Exico, who developed the content for this presentation. Exico's purpose is to advance medicine and human health by turning data into clinically meaningful information, providing valuable new insights in neuroscience. Their goal is to be a leading proponent in the use of AI in clinical development to improve biopharma R&D productivity through the adoption of breakthrough data analytics in precision healthcare. Through the deployment of novel AI algorithms, they analyze and interpret brain scans and digital biosensor data to enable better trial design, patient selection, and ultimately clinical outcomes across all phases of clinical evaluation. Their data analytics services are deployed on some of the most important clinical trials in neuroscience, providing valuable insights to disease progression and patient safety, enabling their clients to make better informed decisions earlier in the clinical development pathway. And now, I'd like to introduce our speakers for today's webinar. Our first speaker is Dr. Victor Velamain, who graduated cum laude in 1983 from the Universidad Nacional de Buenos Aires in Argentina. He continued his postgraduate studies at the Division of Nuclear Medicine at the Johns Hopkins Medical Institutions. Since 2003, when he joined the Neurodegeneration Group in Melbourne, he has performed several preclinical and clinical studies of new AB and tau imaging tracers in animal transgenic models and humans. He has authored and co-authored several book chapters and requested reviews on molecular imaging and more than 300 original research publications. Among honors, he has received the DeLeon Prize in Neuroimaging in 2013, the Christopher Clark Award in 2014, and the Carl Lesson Award in 2018. Since 2016, he has been recognized as one of the world's most influential scientific minds based on his citations being in the top 1% in the world in the field of neuroscience. And now I'd like to present our second speaker, and that is Dr. Richard Mambert, who graduated from the University of Bristol with a master's degree in engineering mathematics and holds a PhD from University College London in medical physics, specializing in PET and MRI image acquisition, motion correction, and image reconstruction. He has published several scientific papers in a number of leading medical imaging journals, including the Journal of Nuclear Medicine, where he was awarded the Alavi Mandel Award. He also won a Young Investigator Award at SN. SNMMI and received the University College London Translational Research Grant in 2016. Richard currently works at Exio as scientific lead across a wide range of therapeutic areas, including Alzheimer, Parkinson's, Huntington's disease, progressive supranuclear palsy, and multiple system atrophy. And now, before I pass over the controls to our first speaker, which is Victor, I'm going to launch our first poll question, which will appear on your screen right now. And there it is in front of you. And I'd greatly appreciate if everyone would participate in this poll question as it's done in real time. And I will be able to share the results with you once I close the polls. So I'll give you about 35 seconds to complete this poll question as you see before you. And the question is, in which stages of TAU, PET imaging implementation within clinical studies are you facing the most challenges? And you have a couple of options below. Uh, please choose one. One option is protocol development trial design. The other one is site setup, image segmentation and QC. And the other option is data interpretation. 
So your participation would be greatly appreciated if I can have everyone now cast their votes and I will close the polls in the next 10 seconds. So please go ahead and select one of those options there. Okay, I am now going to close the polls as it looks like the majority of everyone has voted. So thank you very much for that, it's truly appreciated. I will now close the polls and share the results with you. And those are the results of today's first poll question. And we have 32% of protocol development design, trial design, 13% at site setup, 15% at image segmentation and QC, and 40% at data interpretation. So thank you very much for participating in our first poll question. And now I'm going to pass over the controls to our first speaker, and that is uh, Victor. So Victor, when you are ready, you may begin. Okay, good day to everybody. Thank you for, for the introduction. I will talk about the optimization of tau PET imaging for Alzheimer's clinical development. Here, uh, okay. Here are my disclosures. Uh, the outline of the presentation, I will briefly talk about tau as an imaging target, uh, and then talk about tau imaging in Alzheimer's disease, go over the first and second generation tau tracers, uh, touch a little bit on tau imaging in non id tauopathies, uh, uh, talk about the relationship of tau with uh, amyloid, and then uh, a little bit at the end towards uh, talk about uh, universal tau mask and, and scale. So uh, you know that there are six isoforms of tau and the way they combine, you can, uh, they lead to different uh, tauopathies. Tauopathy type one or secondary tauopathies are a combination of three repeats and four repeats. And there you can find Alzheimer's disease and non-ID uh, tauopathies type one, like Down syndrome, uh, chronic traumatic encephalopathy. Then you have four repeat uh, tauopathies, uh, the, the most common ones are cortical-basal degeneration and progressive supranuclear palsy. And then three repeat tauopathies, which is typical of, of Pick's disease. In the recent years, there had been a, a lot of advance uh, by Gethard and his group. Uh, looking at the, uh, at the conformation of, and the folding of the fibrils. And it's interesting that even the, the same three and four repeat, uh, if you look at Alzheimer's disease uh, tau and then CTE tau, they look the same, but the, the, the folding is slightly different. Much different uh, when you have a four repeat like cortical basal or a three repeat like you have with P. And these uh, foldings can be used to study the places where uh, you can have tau uh, tracers binding, in this case, uh, PBB3. There have been several uh, tau tracers uh, proposed and tested, like the THK series, TETO7, and PBB3. We usually call them the first generation tau tracers. And then a second generation of tau tracers aiming at reducing the off-target binding of the first generation tau tracers. There was also, even now we have a, a tau tracer designed just for, for repeat tau. In Alzheimer's disease, what we typically see is as the signal increases in the cortex, we see uh, an increase in the cognitive impairment, uh, as you can see here. Uh, from, from this level on, all these cases, all the top cases, are high on amyloid. You can also not only see the, the cortical retention of the tracer, but you see the, the retention of tracer in off-target regions, like in, in B, that you can see the, the choroid plexus, or in C, that you can see the basal ganglia. But this distribution of, of, of the tau imaging tracer followed the known distribution of uh, neuropathology, either if you follow the, the Brack and Brack stages or the Delacourt stages. And we can use this tau distribution of tau in the brain to identify in vivo the different tau pathological subtypes uh, in Alzheimer's disease, being limbic predominant, the typical presentation, or the hippocampal sparing. And that's what we have with a, a V1451 of Florcalcipia, which is a first generation tracer. We see the same with second generation tracers. And what's interesting is that the cognitive profile is different for these different uh, subtypes. 
for example, the, the uh, typical presentation is a, a more amnestic presentation, while the, the, the hippocampal sparing, it involves more the non-memory uh, domains. When we look at the relationship between tau and age, what we see if we look at one end of the spectrum and we look at uh, controls, we see, we see a uh, very slow increase over time, and this has been identified as primary age uh, related tauopathy, which is the increase of tau in the mesial temporal cortex without in the absence of amyloid. But when we look at the other end of the spectrum at AD patients, we see that the younger elderly AD patients catch much higher tau than uh, the, their uh, elderly counterparts. And you can see it with different traces, in this case, MK. You can see it with Flortalsepir. This is from Mayo Clinic. You see this is from, from ADNI. Neuropathological studies have shown that tau has a much tighter uh, association with uh, cognition than, than a beta. And we see the same when we do tau imaging studies. Here we have a mini mental state with a high correlation, highly significant correlation with, with tau. And we look at delayed recall, which is a measure of episodic memory, also very highly correlated with tau. When we look at the regional distribution, compare it uh, with the regional distribution of amyloid, we see they are, they are different. While amyloid is very high in the frontal lobe, superior temporal, uh, and sparing usually the, the, the mesial temporal lobe, with tau we have a temporal parietal distribution. It's usually high in the mesial temporal lobe. What is common to both is the posterior singular. And we, we're still looking at this pattern of distribution and we compare to the pattern of, of uh, markers of neurodegeneration like glucose hypometabolism or cortical atrophy. And we see that the pattern of hypometabolism or atrophy follows the pattern of tau distribution in the brain and not amyloid in the brain. Furthermore, what we see is that the, the extent of high tau in the brain is usually high, uh, larger then uh, the, the areas involving hypometabolism of at or atrophy, suggesting that uh, tau might precede these, these processes. And this was confirmed in longitudinal studies. In here we have a uh, longitudinal study with tau, showing that tau in itself doesn't change much. But when we look at the FDG studies at the glucose uh, metabolism, we see that uh, there's uh, increasing hypometabolism in those areas that are high on tau. And the same happens when we look at uh, cortical thickness or uh, brain, uh, gray matter atrophy. The, the areas that, that show uh, progressive atrophy are those areas that are at baseline high on tau. And this is a very important uh, slide showing that the regional distribution of tau and not the amyloid are the ones that are matching the clinical phenotype. For example, in posterior cortical atrophy, we have very high retention in the occipital lobe. In logopenic variant of progressive aphasia, we have involvement of the language centers. And when we have the typical amnestic uh, presentation of, of Alzheimer's, it's mainly the, the, the temporal lobes that are involved. When this, uh, there was a huge uh, study of more, about 700 uh, subjects comparing uh, uh, a beta, the amyloid status and, and tau and comparing different neurodegenerative uh, conditions. And as you can see here, in those with low amyloid in the brain, either controls or MCI, they rarely show cases that have high tau in the brain. But when we look at the, high amyloid in the brain. In the controls, we see the same. Only a very few cases, exceptional cases, of, of controls with high amyloid in the brain have high tau. About 40% uh, of the MC, prodromal AD, uh, high amyloid uh, MCI, do not show how tau in the brain. And about 10 to 20% of the high amyloid Alzheimer's disease patients do not show high uh, uh, tau in the brain. But when compared to the other neurodegenerative uh, disorders, uh, the, the tau 
as an exquisite way to discriminate between Alzheimer's and the other conditions to the point that if you have a, a severe uh, cognitively uh, impaired patient, you first do a tau imaging study. If the tau imaging study is positive, you don't need to do the, the amyloid on that. And it's much better when you compare it to measures of volumetric like hippocampal atrophy or cortical atrophy. But when you move to the MCI stage, the accuracy drops and the actually volumetrics are, are uh, I would say, useless. The, the, the authors of the paper didn't even bother to look at the, the controls because, as, as I said before, there's, there's nothing there to, to be shown. When tau imaging was compared uh, antemortem and postmortem, uh, they found that it's a very high correlation between the findings in, in PET with the findings in, in uh, uh, postmortem. And uh, but when you look at the cases with less tau in the brain, you see that, that the correlation is much lower. When they, they finished the, the phase three study uh, for flotazepir, Abbott published that they uh, announced that, that they have a very high confidence in detecting stage five and six of BRAC and BRAC, but uh, not, not, not uh, stages below that. And it's probably because of this effect that it's, it's not very good to detect low levels of, of uh, tau in the brain. When we compared uh, cases of familiar AD or sporadic AD with the same degree of impairment, we see that familiar AD had much higher tau in the brain than sporadic AD. And even though it's, uh, familiar AD is a, a disease characterized by the overproduction of amyloid, uh, they have much more tau in the brain. When we look at the, the, the different tracers, we saw this before. This is from a different study. Again, increasing cortical tau is associated with increasing cortical impairment. But in here, you can see the, the, the off-target binding in uh, the, the basal ganglia. And in some of the cases, you also see the, the choroid plexus showing up. And that was one of the reasons to develop uh, new new traces trying to avoid that. So uh, first generation tracer carbon 11 PB3 was then uh, labeled with F18, and uh, the, the this F18 radio labeling increased the dynamic range and the signal to, to noise ratio, making higher contrast images. Uh, it prevented from having the uh, uh, radio label metabolite entering the brain, which was the problem of the, the first generation carbon 11 PBB3, and significantly reduce the target binding to the striatum, uh, but at the same time increased tremendously the off-target binding in the choroid plexus, as you can see here. Another of these second generation tracers is Genentech Tau Probe 1 or, uh, or GTP1. Again, it has uh, contrast images, uh, but it still has the off-target binding in, in the, 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 the striatum. And sometimes you can also see the core reflexes. But it's, this tracer is the one that has probably the best uh, kinetics of all the tau tracers. And uh, even in, in cases with very high uh, tau levels, it reaches uh, apparent steady state in a way simplifying the, the, the quantification of the tracer. Here's another second generation tracer developed by Roche, uh, RO948. And again, uh, it shows high contrast images. It actually decreased much more the, the, the off-target binding to, um, to basal ganglia and choroid plexus. And it has much better kinetics than, than uh, the original flotazepine. Here we have another trade, second generation tracer, uh, PI2620, that yields very high contrast images with very low non-specific binding. And as you can see in the controls, if you don't have target, it doesn't bind to anything. But it also has some kind of some degree of off-target binding, as you can see in the scalp, both in AD and control. And because they have uh, uh, hydropho uh, uh, hydrophobic uh, metabolite, that keeps circulating, you can see the longitudinal sinuses. 
and this is the, the latest of the, the second generation uh, Tau tracers, the MK6240. Again, yields very high contrast images uh, in, in the ID. And again, it's very low, almost no uh, tracer uh, retention in the healthy controls uh, when the target is not present. What you see is a halo that is binding, probably like binding to, off-target binding to meninges. So when we compare first generation to second generation tracers, uh, and due to this very low tracer retention in the controls, the second generation have a much better discriminatory power between controls and AD. Uh, much better than the, the first generation tracers in, in all the uh, regions of the brain, like the mesial temporal cortex, the temporal parietal cortex, or the frontal cortex, or a global measure in the, the neocortex. But as I said before, these tracers have a problem that they have, uh, even though it's kind of reversible kinetic, they don't reach steady state during uh, the acquisition of the study, especially when you have high target. When there's no target in the brain, like in the, the controls, you don't have any problem. But as you can see, the tendency is not to reach steady state, which complicates quantification. And this is something that, that uh, uh, Richard will address in his presentation. Briefly, non ad diopathies. Here we have uh, Down syndrome. Those with low amyloid in the brain do not show tau in the brain. Those with high amyloid in the brain, we see the same as we see in AD. Uh, some cases do not, uh, a few cases do not show high tau in the brain. The other ones show the, the, the tau in the brain. And if this tau in the brain follows the, non, the similar pattern that we see in Alzheimer's disease. But when we look at uh, former National Football uh, League players, we see that the, the regional distribution of, of tau in the brain is, is different. We see mainly retention in the frontal uh, temporal, uh, in the dorsolateral prefrontal areas and in the mesial temporal lobe, which follows the, the, the description of, of the McKee scale of tau deposition. And if you look at the, the scans, they look at the either stage three or stage four, which is different with the typical, most posterior presentation that you see in Alzheimer's disease. Looking at uh, four repeat diopathies, these traces, as we talked before, PI 2620, can, can bind to four repeat diopathies, in this case, uh, PSP or corticobasal degeneration. They have a completely different pattern of brain retention that we see in AD. And if you compare with ID, you also have lower retention of the tracer because you have a lower density of tau in these uh, four repeat diopathies, and the tracer itself has a, mat, a slow, slightly lower affinity for four repeat tau. When we look at the relationship of tau with, with amyloid and we plot cortical amyloid and cortical tau, we see that the relation tends not to be completely linear. And uh, when we put the threshold for, for both, uh, we see that the, when we look at the control, we see that about 60% do not show uh, high amyloid or high tau. About 24% or uh, between 20 and 30% usually have high amyloid in the brain. But we have about 10% that have high amyloid and high tau. It's not as you can look here in the in the graph. It's not as high as you can see in, in MCI or AD. But these subjects have significant pathological uh, burden, but they don't they don't affect. They still perform within cognitive normal cognitive uh, limits. When we look at the other extreme in in the AD, we have 75 percent, uh, 70 80 percent usually have. Uh, high amyloid and high tau, but then we have between 50 and 20 percent of them that have high amyloid but low tau, and this needs to be considered too. So looking at this graph, being this nonlinearity, it appears that high tau in neocortical regions is associated with high neocortical beta, suggesting detectable cortical beta precedes detectable cortical tau. And the uh, main work here is detectable. We have to remember that tau 
the density of tau is at least one order of magnitude lower than amyloid. So assuming the same stoichiometry of these tracers and the same affinity, you need 10 times more tau to have the same signal that you get with the beta. When we look at how they, changes, uh, how they change over time between the, the two, we see that we detect uh, amyloid accumulation mandarly, reaching a threshold of abnormality at 20 centiloids. And then when we go above 50 centiloids, we see spreading of, of tau in, in the cortical regions. And this is, a, as you can see, a very slow process. It, it takes more, more by about 20 years. When we plot the, the amyloid over time and the, the threshold of abnormality, we see that it takes about 20 years to go from being abnormal to reach the level that we usually see in, in Alzheimer's disease. When we plot the, the mesial temporal tau, we see that it takes about three to four years to become abnormal uh, after amyloid becomes abnormal. When we look at temporal parietal, this is really a cortical, uh, neocortical region. We see that it takes about 12 years to 10 to 12 years, uh, 12, 12, 10 to 12 years to become abnormal after amyloid. And when we look at the frontal areas, it takes about 14 years to become abnormal. And here is the, the, the mark of 50 centiloids, which is what we consider that, that is marking uh, the levels at, of amyloid that we start seeing uh, cortical tau. When we look at the disease progression in healthy controls, and this is eight year follow up, we see that the ones who actually progress to MCI and AD are those who at baseline are above 50 centiloids. And those are the only ones that show significant progression over time. When we look at the, the cognitive trajectories, and here is an, a global measure of cognition, we see that only those that have above 50 centiloids are the ones uh, that show cognitive decline, uh, significant cognitive decline over time. As you can see, it's more related to, to the, the tau. So this adapted from, from Professor Jack. So he said that before any significant amyloid deposition, tau starts accumulating in the mesial temporal cortex, and almost everybody in the population develops primary age-related tauopathy at some point in time. By itself, this tauopathy produces non to mild clinical symptomatology. Independently from, from part, a beta starts accumulated in your cortical areas, and some point in time, either amyloid or some other uh, stress uh, reaches a certain threshold or triggers some yet undetermined mechanism and induces the spread of tauopathy from mesial temporal to widespread neocortical association areas. And the severe clinical symptoms are mainly due to the accelerated and expanding tauopathy in your cortical areas, not due to amyloid deposition. This was el very elegantly shown, this, this work from, from Harvard, where amyloid accumulation leads to tau accumulation, and it's actually tau accumulation that leads to cognitive decline. We also look at uh, the, the works uh, looking at the longitudinal changes in tau, and this is in, very important for clinical trials. You need to know what's the, the, the natural history of tau accumulation in the brain. And uh, Cliff Jack, when, when he looked at comparing A beta positive with A beta negative controls. We saw that the two regions that showed the maximum change over time were the entorhinal cortex and the posterior cingulate uh, gyrus. When he looked at the comparison between A beta positive MCIs and ND versus A beta positive controls, he found that still the posterior cingulate continued to accumulate tau, but now you have high accumulation in the temporal regions and in the occipital regions, but the entorhinal cortex seemed to have stopped accumulating tau at this stage. So we have been working at developing a universal tau mass, which is based on, on different tracers. So we did a subtraction of, of the tau in uh, AD uh, subtracted by to the A beta negative controls and for the three, in this case, three different tracers. And then we try to find which is the, the intersection or the commonality or common uh, 
uh, voxels on, on this uh, mass, and we created the composite mass. And this composite mass, we, we then subtracted what's Y matter, uh, mass the Y matter out, and then we generated a mirror image to cover uh, all of the similar regions in both uh, hemispheres. So now we have this, this area that is common to, to, to several tau traces over which several different global or regional sampling or composite can be applied, customized for purpose, ID, early tau detection, clinical trials. And the results obtained with different traces from the same global sampling can be expressed together under the 10 center, or we call it center, or uh, center set if expressed at set scores. As a conclusion, tau imaging allows the in vivo assessment, staging, and quantification of tau pathology in the brain, and in some non id tauopathies too. It also allows exploring the relationship of tau with cognition, a beta, and other biomarkers, and assess how these pathologies change with time and or treatment. Here are my acknowledgments. Thank you very much for your attention. Well, thank you very much. And now I'm going to pass over the controls to our second speaker. So thank you very much, Victor. I'm going to pass over the controls now to Richard. Richard, you may begin when you are ready. Thanks, Sonia. Um, and thanks, Victor. Um, and hi, everyone. Um, so we've heard from Victor about how Tau can be used as an imaging target with PET um, and about the latest research utilizing PET tracers in AD and non-AD. Um, and now I'm going to show a few slides on how these approaches can be applied to large clinical trials. I'm taking a slight step back from the Tau literature by looking at advances in operational delivery of Tau capabilities and at recent scientific research addressing the optimization of Tau PET image analysis. So to use Tau PET in large trials, there's a number of operational and scientific challenges which I'm going to discuss in um, site setup, data acquisition, image consistency and quality control, PET radiological reads, image analysis methodologies, and QC of imaging endpoints. So I'll give a quick introduction to Ixico. Um, we've got experience delivering services to clinical trials at all phases since the company was founded in 2004 in London. At the start, the focus was on Alzheimer's, but since then we've been involved in trials in Huntington's disease, multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's, PSB, schizophrenia, ataxia, and some others. We currently have around 65 staff made up of over 70% qualified to masters or PhD level. Um, Nexco has worked with many of the world's leading biopharma companies, including the majority of the top CROs, and we're involved in several scientific consortia in imaging and biosensors, including major academic industry funded studies such as Amipad. Over the years, we've qualified qualified over 2,000 imaging sites and um, delivered over 20,000 eligibility and safety reports, analyzed over 100,000 brain scans and worked across over 50 countries. I won't go into the details of this slide, but it's basically showing that we offer end-to-end -end clinical services within neuroscience. And you can see that that covers program design, site setup, project management, reading analysis, and data management within a regulatory compliant framework. I think these slides will be available after this session, so if you want to look at any of this in more detail, you can do. This slide gives a summary of our main operational platform called Trial Tracker, which allows us to manage trial data across all stages. So from the far left, this starts with image acquisition, where sites can upload imaging data like PET, MR, and CT, as well as clinical assessment and biosensor data. Once the data is in our system, it then goes through our various automated and manual quality control pipelines, such as metadata and image QC. The data can then be sent either for radiological read by one of our network of central readers and KOLs, where images are viewed and read forms are filled out inside the Chartrex system. Um, images can also be sent through one of many image analysis pipelines that run through the same system, and then the results can be viewed and reports can be configured to provide uh, results back to clients or sponsors. Uh, this slide kind of gives an overview of how we process data in clinical trials, but I'll give more details on each of these steps um, in some of the next slides. The main point of um, good site setup is to ensure consistency of good quality data throughout the duration of a trial. This starts from site selection, ensuring sites have a TAL tracer distribution network, allowing access to the tracer when they need it, considering the relatively low half-life. Um, we obtain information about the site's general PET imaging capabilities through site surveys, 
where we also look for information such as plan scan upgrades that can cause data consistency issues in longitudinal studies. Once the sites are selected, we then work with the sites to implement imaging protocols, provide instructions on phantom scanning, uh, review test scans, um, whilst providing site training along the way. So this slide just shows an overview of the types of data we aim to assist sites to acquire. Um, on the left, you can see the types of tracers that can be used from tau tracers, such as the Lily, G, um, and Merck tracers, some of which Victor showed images from, um, through to some more commonly used in previous large trials, such as FDG and amyloid tracers. The time required between the injection and the start of scanning then depends on the type of data you want to acquire, um, and the images on the right show some examples. At the top, you can see a set of standard static frames acquired after tracer, tracer distribution reaches a relatively stable state. Um, and I say relatively stable because a steady state is difficult with tau tracers currently. Um, next to that, we've shown a brain segmentation to produce regions of interest, such as for BRAC stages that can be used to calculate regional SUVR results. This segmentation can either be found with a single subject atlas using the PET image alone, or from subject specific MRI data using our own algorithm called LEAP, which I'll go into in a bit more detail later. Then we also have the option for dynamic imaging at the time of injection to produce parametric images and to allow for dynamic analysis and tracer kinetics, um, such as binding potential or distribution volume ratio. Accounting for the input function can be critical in longitudinal trials to produce accurate results um, due to confounding variables such as blood, blood brain barrier permeability, um, peripheral binding, blood flow, um, etc. At the bottom, we also have the option of producing an extra image for visual read, um, usually by combining the static frame images and then smoothing. So image consistency starts with good site setup and training. And once a site is selected, we provide a detailed imaging protocol. This slide shows an example um, for the PI2620 tracer, where we're looking to acquire a CT with dynamic pet acquisition at the time of injection, starting from five second frames, moving to one minute and five or 10 minute frames, totaling 30 minutes. Um, this protocol is called a coffee break protocol because it allows the subject to get out of the scanner for 30 minutes after the dynamic scan before getting back in and acquiring the standard static scan um, of six five minute frames. Overall, this shows a 90 minute protocol, but this is just an example and would, could be set depending basically on the towel endpoints and the tracer being used in the study. So as well as showing what the imaging protocol should look like, we also provide details of a bespoke acquisition protocol, um, including all tracer acquisition, timing and reconstruction information to ensure consistency across scans within a single site. So this slide shows an excerpt of a protocol we would provide to a site um, specific for their scanner. And I've highlighted some of the most important bits. Uh, so first, the time between injection and scan start is set um, with an allow allowable tolerance, which shows that the data can't be reliable, reliably analyzed outside of this window. Um, and then tracer dose also has a prescribed value with allowable range. So here it's nine to 11 millisieverts. Um, all reconstruction parameters should be set such as number of iterations and iterative recon. And um, it would also include information on multiple reconstructions of the same data such for a standard image and for a read image with all the frames summed and this smoothing applied as shown here. I won't, into it, I won't go into too much detail on this slide, but I just want to show that once we get phantom images from sites, we then check that metadata is consistent with what we requested um, and we do some quantitative work looking at recovery coefficients. Then we have the chance to tune parameters to ensure consistency across sites. Um, so the plot on the top right, you can see what we're aiming for by setting all scanners, regardless of manufacturer, in the recovery coefficient window. And at the bottom is an image from a paper showing the full effect of narrowing the variance with um, careful harmonization. So once the PET data is acquired and it's uploaded into our system, it undergoes a number of QC steps. First, it goes through series labeling where DICOM data is compared to reference data set up from test data from the site. So each image has a label applied that controls where it goes next. So for example, attenuation corrected PET images would go for image analysis and through the various image analysis pipelines. Um, and a PET read image would be sent for radiological read. Um, all DICOM tags are then checked against predefined tolerances as part of an automated met metadata QC process and sites can be queried 
if the acquisition protocol has not been adhered to. This table shows various DICOM tags like uh, serial device number that has zero tolerance um, because we don't want that to change over time um, and other DICOM tags like dose and scan start time which have some defined tolerances that are checked. So assuming metadata QC looks good, images then get a full visual QC by our team of trained analysts. Um, so for Tau pet imaging studies, often CT images will still be checked as artifacts in the CT can cause artifacts in the pet image where CT is used for attenuation correction. And the MR is checked if the segmentation used to look at regional tracer uptake is produced from the MR image. Um, so this slide shows some typical artifacts that we would look for at the image QC stage. Um, so the CT images show examples of beam hardening, motion and streaking artifacts. Um, in the MR images from left to right, you can see examples of ringing, susceptibility, wrap artifacts, and on the right image, the crosshair shows where the scanner ISO center was at the acquisition, which we check to avoid differences in geometric distortion across time points. Um, the PET images show examples of cerebellum truncation, misaligned, non-attenuation corrected PET image with CT, and along the bottom, a case where the head has moved between the two PET frames, which is clear from the misalignment with the CT in the first frame. To support the implementation of centralized reads in a clinical trial setting, it's essential for the reader workflow to be facilitated within a single data management system. Within the trial tracker system, for example, that we have, that can be, the data can be pushed or extracted by the reader with simultaneous central access to dosing information, historical read forms, and the read form completed within the same system. Automatic reporting to the site directly from us allows for rapid decision-making on eligibility. It also allows visibility and data access for site PI, DSMB and sponsor. So there's a number of different Tau PET rating scales available and the choice of scale will be study dependent. A database which allows bespoke configuration of the read form and report allows for trial specific reader workflows to be created and tailored to the trial specific criteria. Electronic read forms with integrated logic and automated quality checks also minimize error rates. A centralized read minimizes reader variance uh, with the controlled selection of expert readers who can be trained on the specific workflow of this trial. It's also advised to perform inter and intra rater testing using a gold standard data set both pre study and throughout the course of the study. So the example read form here on the right shows a rating scale, including medial inferior and lateral temporal lobes and medial and lateral parietal lobes with a one to three severity rating of uptake for each. So overall, the tau positive rating could then be set based on a defined criteria of the above ratings, however that chooses to be set for that trial. So this is another slide I won't go into too much detail on, but it shows the various types of imaging and endpoints we might typically use in an AD trial. So MRI and PET could be used for eligibility and patient stratification, then analysis, for efficacy might include structural MRI for volumetrics, uh, advanced MRI such as DTI and fMRI, and SUVR or dynamic imaging with amyloid or tau tracers. So as we've seen earlier for tau PET data analysis, we usually want to look at regional measures in the brain, whether that's SUV, SUVR, DVR, or time activity curves, et cetera. So to look at any metric in a particular region, we need to accurately segment the brain, which we do either with a single subject atlas such as AAL, or if MRI has been acquired with our own subject specific method called LEAP. So LEAP stands for Learning Embeddings for Atlas Propagation and uses a multi-atlas approach to segment the brain into over 150 structures. Um, this algorithm has been optimized for various regions in different therapeutic areas where volume change is a key imaging biomarker. This slide just shows some important regions in various diseases. So for example, hippocampus atrophy is a marker of disease progression in AD, but we can also use the whole brain segmentation to look at tau trace uptake in areas such as amygdala, hippocampus, um, enterorhinal cortex, or form composites of BRAC regions. Uh, this, slide, this slide just shows um, in a bit more detail the stages of how the LEAP algorithm works. Um, I won't go into the details again, but I'm including it here for reference if anyone wants to go back through and have a look at the slides later. As an example of a simple type of tau PET image processing, I thought I'd go through the steps of our regional SUVR pipeline. We always aim to get the standard PET data acquired 
collect well yeah acquired some time post injection in the form of multiple frames so the first pre-processing pre step is to remove any poor quality frames before the frames are co-registered and averaged together if there's a t1 image um, then the t1 is registered to pet space and the leap segmentation can be transformed to pet space before regional activity is extracted using any other region as the reference region a similar methodology can be carried out for different types of pet images derived from a dynamic acquisition to look at like tracer kinetics or DVR. So it's important for imaging and clinical trials that we quality control our endpoint measures to ensure the results are accurate, especially considering the majority of the image processing is automated. Um, so this is done as part of a visual endpoint QC that we carry out. First, we check that the MR and PET images are well aligned after registration, which this image shows. Um, then we check that the individual frames have been well registered together, and we can see from these frames that they look well aligned with the skull in the CT image. We also check the regional segmentation with the MR and PET images to check that the segmentation is consistent with the anatomy and also that the segmentation is accurate. In this example, um, you can see that there's a posterior and anterior over segmentation of the cerebellum. So in this study, if the cerebellum was a region of interest, this would cause the SUVR to be underestimated. So it would be marked as a fail. So finally, this slide, this slide just shows the type of data we would deliver back to our clients. Um, this is a per subject report showing regional binding potential and SUVR acquisition details such as tracer dose and acquisition time, regional time activity curves, and example images of the PET and MR images uh, with associated regional segmentations. I think you can see those um, colored on the top right. So we would also send full files in a spreadsheet format so all the data can be, well, it's tabulated and can be directly built into the statistical analysis pipeline for that trial. Okay, I think that's all from me. So thanks for listening and I'll hand back to Sonia. Well, thank you very much for that, uh, Richard. Now we're going to uh, go into our first poll question for today, uh, or actually not our first poll question, but our second poll question uh, before we go into the Q&A portion of the webinar. So I just want to say thank you very much to Richard and Victor for the presentation. So I'm going to launch the first poll question and then we'll go into the uh, Q&A session. So the poll question is being launched. You should see it there in front of you. I'll give you about 35 seconds to begin that or to end, to complete that and then I will share the results with you as this is done in real time so your participation will be greatly appreciated so go ahead and complete that and the question is for upcoming webinars which of the following topics most interest you wearable and sensors within neurodegenerative diseases, volumetric MRI and AD, imaging analysis for neuro-rare diseases, or other? It looks like the majority of everyone has voted, so I do appreciate that. But if I can get the rest of you to vote right now, that'd be greatly appreciated. I'll give you another 10 seconds, and then I will close the polls and share the results. Okay, so I'm now going to close the poll and share the results. And here are the results of our last poll question. And it is 26% wearable and sensors within neurodegenerative diseases, 26% of volumetric MRI and AD, 43% and anal imaging analysis for neuro-rare diseases, and 4% for other. So thank you very much for participating in that poll question. Uh, now we're going to go into our Q&A session of the webinar. So if you haven't done so already, please go ahead and do so now. Um, please send your comments in using the chat box and we'll try to attend to them during the webinar. And it looks like I've received a couple of questions already, so I will start with those. So Richard and Victor, are you ready? We're yeah. Okay. Yep. All right. So here's yes, the first. Sir. Okay, great. So actually, this first question is for you, Victor. What are the features okay. of the perfect tau tracer in clinical practice? Oh. As uh, Professor Diegas used to say, the best out tracer is the one we know least about. Uh, but what I would say is that the one that shows the, the best contrast, uh, the lowest non-specific binding, and no uh, off-target binding. And we are moving in that direction. We, I don't think we are there yet, but we, we as I showed bef uh, before, 
we have a couple of, of very good traces now uh, that have much, much less uh, of target binding and much better uh, determination between AV and controls and much better signal to noise uh, ratio. Okay, perfect. Uh, yeah. Uh, anything on your side? No? Okay. All right. So I'll go to the next question. I thought maybe uh, Victor might have something there. Uh, this actually, the next question is for you, Richard, again. Uh, the question is, could you please comment on the validation of the visual tau pet read shown in the slides and how XAO en envisions its use in clinical trials? Exico. Hi. Pardon me. I'm sorry. I like to say Hi. that again. Exico envision its use in clinical trials. Hi. Thanks for the question. Um, so the example I showed of the visual read is basically that it's an example. Um, I think it's still an open question in the research and it depends on the tracer. Um, the scale we showed as an example read, including I think in medial, inferior, lateral, temporal lobes and some others um, was from an abstract by Sonny et al, I think. Um, there's a few abstracts around, but the research is fairly early in that in doing reads. Um, as Victor showed, I think with the stentaloid like tau scale, different traces react differently in different brain regions. So it might be the case of using a different tau rating scale for different traces or applying a mask um, to the image before the read. Um, but basically with our system, we can kind of set up the read form and that visual read. We're kind of flexible to how, to how that trace is looking at the time. Um, I don't know if you have anything to add to that, Victor. Uh, I, I do agree with that. Okay, so then I can go on to the next question. Uh, the next question is, can you comment on the development and the use of analytical mythologies beyond the use of region of interest analysis to assess burden and the potential impact in the drug development? Uh, I can comment, but I think it's more for, for Richard. Uh, you can use uh, uh, statistical parametric imaging so you don't constrain yourself to specific regions of interest. So you can compare groups before and after treatment uh, and see where, which are the regions that show changes over time. Richard, you can complete that, yeah. Yeah, I think um, Victor kind of summed it up. Um, so we can do, I mean, I would say generally what we see from sponsors is they, pref they often prefer SUVR, which I think in the research world is not seen as like the most accurate or the most informative measure but it's often the simplest thing to set up especially when you're dealing with i don't know 100 sites in a large trial suvr it means that you can train the sites easily um and it's just something that's reliable and even if you can do you know if you can do some dynamic imaging at the beginning to kind of correct for the issues you find with suvr then that can also help um i think SUVR also is, I think, especially with these scales, these centeloid like scales that mean you can compare between different traces, then having a kind of standard SUVR image that's easy to um, kind of comprehend what it's showing then is often the best thing, I think. <clears throat> okay, thank you very much. Uh, here's another question. I think this one might be for Richard. Uh, what software platform does Leap uses? Um, so Leap is our own um, segmentation algorithm at Xco. So I think it's it's kind of built into our trial tracker system um, with Python and Bash code. Um, there's quite a few papers on the methodology um, floating around, um, so people can always implement something similar. But I think we don't have a kind of separate software platform that's available, as far as I know, for other people to use. Um, there's obviously other more freely available. Um, segmentations similar using MRI images, but yeah, our, our LEAP one is just kind of on our own system. Okay, thank you very much for that. I'll go to the next question here. Uh, let's see if I can find it here. Okay, here it is. What are the obstacles to overcome in order to achieve successful tau imaging in vivo? And, and Victor, I, I think we overcame a lot of obstacles. Uh, because tau is not a very easy target for, for imaging. But, but in the last 10 years, we have been developing tracers and we're getting better at that. Uh, now we have to see, uh, to implement these for, for, 
for trials. Uh, the, the information that, that I show is what we need before the trials is to know the natural history of tau accumulation. So we know if we, that can be changed by, by some therapy or not. Uh, but I, I think we have been quite successful in, in, in achieving that. Uh, we started back in 2010, 22, 2009. And now we have plenty of, of tau tracers, uh, much better than the, the original ones we have. Uh, this is Richard yeah. as well. Um, so yeah, I think Victor's has, Victor has more experience um, than me, but I think just operationally as well, as I kind of showed a few slides on, even right back to the beginning for, for larger trials rather than academic trials, um, picking the right sites at the start. So, so they need to have access to the tracers, um, for us, preferably with experience of using tau traces or at least of traces in a research setting. So they're used to the timings and what the images should look like. Um, and then also kind of after that, the quality quality control of images, um, being able to pick up issues even when uptake's fairly localized. Um, and then again, I guess on that same point for the analysis, um, you might need to kind of tune your algorithms. So if you're used to looking at kind of FDG scans, the image registration methods you might want to use um, to register between PET frames or between PET and MR images might need to be tuned just because they would be affected by a kind of fairly localized uptake potentially with the tau tracer, depending on the tracer. Okay, thank you. Uh, it looks like we have time for another question or maybe one or two questions, so let's try to squeeze this in. It looks like this question is for Victor. Uh, the question here is, what is the most sensitive quantitative analysis technique? Uh, for tau, uh, depending on the question. If the question is to compare groups uh, cross-sectionally, uh, I think the SUVR does a, a pretty good job. In a, it's a simple measure, it's a tissue uh, ratio, easy obtainable, very short scanning time. If you're looking for longitudinal measures or in clinical trials, you have to go uh, to binding potential or uh, DVR, distribution volume ratios, because they, they take into account the input function that might change uh, either by the drug or the progression of the disease. So you need to account for that. And uh, unfortunately, uh, most or almost every uh, amyloid trial did not do that. So the results are quite questionable uh, using just SUVR. Thank you very much. Here's another question. Um, actually, it's for Victor. Is there a preferential binding of the second generation tracer to a specific tau isoform? Well, we have six isoforms. Uh, the, the, the problem is, is, is I don't think so. Uh, what what uh, makes a preferential binding would be the association of these isoforms. Uh, and as I, I showed, these uh, foldings are exposed in different amino acids where these tracers can bind. And essentially they are these fibrils, their beta sheet bindings, and the way they fold these, these fibrils are the ones that are creating these pockets for these traces to bind. And it's different uh, for, for the different combination of the isoforms. If you have a, a I was showing the, the folding of the four repeat uh, isoform in cortical basal, it's completely different from the folding that you have in Alzheimer's disease. And that exposes different kinds of amino acids and uh, the, the tracer will bind to that groove that exposes those amino acids. So it's not mainly, it's not essentially the isoform, it's a combination of the isoform that leads to a different, uh, specific conformation. And that conformation is that what uh, leads to a specific binding. We have to remember, also remember that the tau protein is a very large protein. Only a small portion of the protein aggregates and uh, forms beta sheet. And even that, uh, so we, we, we might have different traces to bind to different portions of that aggregated uh, uh, tau. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm gonna squeeze in one last question and then, then we'll have to end the webinar. So let's do this one last question here. In the framework of AD, in which sequence would you locate tau and amyloid PET? Which one for first? Uh, yeah. Hi, this is, oh, sorry, go on, Victor. Uh, it all depends uh, what is the question and what is the population you're looking at. 
uh, if, if you're looking at AD with severe cognitive impairment, you might look just as, at, at Tau. If you look at uh, healthy controls, you should look only at amyloid because there's no, usually no Tau. That's why they are cognitively unimpaired. But essentially, yeah. for, for a clinical trial, you should assess both. So you have a, a much better characterization of your population. Go ahead, Richard. Hi, this is Richard. Yeah, I think the only thing I would add is that, as Victor showed, um, if you're looking kind of pre MCI or AD, um, the you're you're going to see uptake um, in amyloid potentially like years earlier than than tau, um, depending on what region of the brain you're looking at. I think he showed you know between like a couple of years and like ten years in some cases. So I guess in general you're always going to see amyloid um, first. Okay, well, thank you very much for those questions. I'd like to thank our audience members for who contributed to that, so thank you. We have reached the end of the question and answer portion of the webinar. And if we couldn't attend to your questions, the team at Exico may try to follow up with you after the presentation. If you have any further questions, please direct them to the email address that's on your screen. Thank you everyone for participating in today's webinar. You will be receiving, sorry about that, you will be receiving a follow-up email from Xtalks with an access to the recorded archive for this event. A survey window will be popping up on your screen. Your participation is greatly appreciated as it will help us to improve on our further webinars. Now, I'm about to send you a link in your chat box. You'll be able to view the recording of this event at that link and also share this link with your colleagues when they register for the recording as well. So I encourage you to do that. And get more out of today's presentation by downloading the supporting materials available under the handouts tab. We have four handouts there for you to look at. So now I'd like to please uh, have everyone thank our speakers, Dr. Richard Manber and Dr. Victor L. Valimage, for their very insightful presentation. We hope you found this webinar informative. It has been my pleasure to be your webinar moderator. On behalf of the team here at X Talks, we thank you for joining us. I'm Sonia Hunt. Until next time, take care and bye for now. Okay.